like to welcome to you all today to the series of Aussie DJ legends, a very good friend of mine and a very well-known identity in Adelaide. Her name is Dr. Kathy. She was awarded her thesis on Adelaide dance music culture in the late 80s to early 1990s, a topic on which she has lectured and published on nationally and internationally. She has a 30-year career as an actor, as a dancer, choreographer and theatre maker and as a director at Oz Dance, the peak body for dance in Australia. Welcome to my show, Kathy. Thanks very much, Jo. Um, it's very exciting to be here and to have the honour of interviewing you today. Thank you. Um, firstly, yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, it's my, my honour. Um, <laughs> and firstly, um, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we um, meet today, the Ghana people, um, and acknowledge their elders past, present and future. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, yes, here we are. Um, having before, a chat. before we start, I want to yeah. ask you about the thesis yeah. and about what you're writing about yes. the dance music culture. Just let everyone know about that because it's really important that you're taking down a lot of this history of South Australia and outside as well. Well, that's right. And it really, it's the, this is the context and the reason that we've come together, I suppose, because it's been a 10-year project. Um, the thesis was awarded in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, but it seemed to me there was a, a very big gap in knowledge around the significance of Adelaide as part of a contributor musically generally, particularly when I started the thesis. There wasn't much acknowledgement of the role that South Australia and Adelaide had had generally, um, mm -hmm. you know, even considering the whole Jimmy Barnes, Cold Chisel Legacy, uh, the Angles, all the, all the things that had sort of preceded, um, you know, the dance music scene that, that, that we grew up through. Um, and having been through that, I felt that there was a number of things that hadn't been documented properly in Adelaide. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I had a, a, a supervisor too, who is a thesis supervisor, and her PhD um, was in Bushdorf culture and the whole rave scene on the East Coast. And when I said to her, because I was teaching media and communication up at UniSA at that time, and when I said to her, oh, did you know about the Adelaide scene? She said, what Adelaide scene? And that's when I went, oh, <laughs> no one knows apart from us how yeah. incredible that period of time was. Yeah. Um, yeah. From the beginning of, I suppose, the new wave scene transist into uh, the birth of Acid House and then the whole explosion of techno and the techno that was being made here in Adelaide at a really early time, you know, the, the Juice Records guys and going into Dirty House, that whole, you know, and we took it for, well, I took it for granted and it wasn't until I suppose um, I was much older and I suppose I'd begun to see how dance music was being documented by, um, mostly academically at that point as a sort of a seismic shift as a really important cultural, uh, um, a bit like the birth of rock and roll. Mm. Um, and that's where it seemed to me very important to start writing about Adelaide, um, you know, and, and I got a scholarship to do so. And it was, I certainly identified by academia um, and I got a scholarship to do it as a significant thing wow. to document. So yeah, very exciting to have had the privilege to do that. And that sort of set off a, a whole series of, of interviews that I had to do and mm. collection of data and oh, ephemera wow. and, and my own memories of dancing in the scene. You know, it was a huge creative time for all of us. And I think uh, as a dancer going from being classically trained to watching hip hop and learning the shuffle and, and shuffling you know, very early on before we knew it was called that yeah. on the, you know, in the toucan and, you know, being able to improvise as well was such a big part of that. So it was this yeah. sort of two, this double world in a way, I suppose, between my very formal dance training and this amazing kind of new style, new mm -hmm. style of everybody dancing together and learning from each other. Yeah. And that evolution was fascinating. So I wanted yeah. to be able to document that as well. Yeah, that's amazing because... Um, when you talk about that, um, I'm, I'm 57 now, and when I was a kid, it was all about free media. It was very Barnsy, Fonzy and Wanzy, but you know, thank God for Molly Meldrum and Countdown because I remember, I mean, rock music was there. It was great, right, and I collected records, but when they started infiltrating in even things like, you know, all the 80s groups like, um, you know, Bronsky Beat and Erasure and, you know, the explosion of gothics in, in South Australia and the gothic scene, which amalgamated into the gay scene and I was DJing back then and that's what we had access to but then as soon as we had record stores like Central Station and I'm talking the early 80s and the, the, the record store I started buying from was a, a gentleman called Soul Man he was it was a Soul Man record store in Gay's Arcade and I managed to stumble across it somehow but I was always buying music elsewhere in, in the big majors but then there was this guy there and then all of a sudden Central Station popped up up the stairs 
And, you know, people thought Adelaide was a backwater or, or Australia was a backwater. And there's, there were always you hear interviews are saying, well, you know, we were the first with Asset House and we were the first to this and we were with this, but we were not that far behind the rest of the world. You know, well, so, no, and there's no doubt in terms of um, techno production that we're the first in Australia to produce techno that impacts international markets. Mm -hmm. So the paper that was published that I did was about how we contribute to the formation of techno um, as a genre at a very early stage because it is a global sound um, and that whole period, if, if you remember, was all about glo global connection. Mm -hmm. Everything's gone back again to kind of being very much, you know, we've kind of contracted back again. Um, mm -hmm. But that time was all about expansion, making contacts with people overseas, um, kind of losing a sense of place in a way, escaping yeah. from, you know, where we were. And one of the things I remember um, seeing a photo, coming across a photo of you at some point too, which I think's in the in the thesis, um, and it's a photo of the mall, and it must be in the sort of the late 80s, and you're mm -hmm. sitting with your friends in the mall um right next to the mall's balls and kind of in, in punk gear and and there's two very straight looking um people walking towards you know and it showed and what it showed was that complete divide that there was yeah. at that time um in adelaide between i i um, grew up with gothic people. people yeah and i i lived in a house i was 16 i was working at hungry jacks um i moved out of home I took my record boxes and moved into this home where all of us went to the two can two in between two tag two Mars bar, um, the, the rocks would go see the lime spiders, you know, and I was only the really semi straight looking group person in the whole group of us. And it was like that we'd hang out in the mall, we'd go to these places and it was very, very different back then where there was a merging of communities. Um, now, I'll get into that interview when I interviewed Lexi Bradfield, but the, the time that the Mars bar was closed, it was a very short period of time there wasn't anywhere for the gays to go. So we were very mixed up of where we could go. We could either go to the Colonel Light Hotel, which was very gay man orientated. There was the Pleasure Club, which is now where the uni is on Curry Street. Um, there was um, a couple of other small pubs. And there was also these unlikely lesbian bars that I found in, in places um, that I used to go to. So I used to sneak off from my friends and, and they'd go to the Gothic places and then I'd find these little gay haunts. And then we'd come together at places like the Piscinium. Um, there was a, probably a ton of places. And there was also that place um, on the Rundle Mall off of um, near the end of Adelaide Arcade and it was downstairs and a lot of the Gothic people used to go there. I don't know if you remember it well, um, it, it was like a cafe, coffee shop, had a hairdresser down there. Oh, not, the, all... not, the not the tropical. Mm, not sure. I'll have, to, I'll have to do some research on that one. But it was somewhere where we all hung out. We'd go down there and there was a record store and all the Gothics would go down there. There was, I think, I believe the hairdresser down there and they'd all have their hair like this so you know the music culture of you know Adelaide alone was what's never ever backwatered it was never never behind it was some of us DJs that were buying all the stuff from Europe and all the Italio house and all the stuff thank god for Central Station Records to be honest with you and Soul Man for bringing in what he was bringing well, all those um, independent uh, records I mean record shops too I mean like Andromeda because before we got to Central Station there were the sort of the the indie record shops that would get all the imports mm -hmm. um all your punk music you said you it wasn't goth then it was sort of black it was kind of undefined that sort of new synth, yes. synth wave the, uh, pop at that time which wasn't and particularly it, main mm. but they were Bell. also getting dance music dance mm. music yeah and ian exactly ian, ian Bell. Bell, um famous oh, I, when I went, dj who yeah. had a big influence on all, on all of us I when think. i went to um, his um funeral um or his wake I learned more about him because we followed him everywhere. And the Toucan Two, the legendary DJ, who would drop the Batman theme at the drop of a hat and everyone would just go absolutely nuts. You know, the guy was all over the shop, but he had his finger on the pulse. You know, a lot of the indie stuff, a lot of the, you know, all the gothic stuff. And we loved it. It was such a contrast to dance music. Yeah. And look, so many um, of the DJs I've interviewed, and particularly HMC as well, have talked about the influence of, of Ian um, on them because he could play, he had that ability to cross genre and, and mix it up and he just played what he really liked mm. and somehow it connected with people. So, you know, Le Freak, he had his disco at a time when disco really wasn't popular. You know, he was spinning disco and we'd all go nuts for it. Um, so he ran counter, but he also kind of got exact, he also hit the zeitgeist on the head too, I think. Yeah. Because because that's what was happening globally. There was this amazing kind of mashup of all different styles that were happening for people who wanted something different from sort of the top 40. But look, Joe, first of all, I want to just give a bit of context as well too, because look, we're here today because we're, sort of, I suppose, celebrating the fact that you've been um, nominated as one of the advertisers 
top 50, over 50 um, most influential women in South Australia, which is, mm. you know, really exciting. And I, I was excited because it was a female DJ for a start. Mm who had been acknowledged in that um, roll call. Um, and, you know, sometimes I feel in Australia we don't always value our artists. Um, mm. And even if, you know, yes, people might get Sydney Nolan or Jeffrey Smart or visual artists, um, but I was really heartened um, to see that uh, a DJ was being acknowledged as an artist as well too and and that profession and it was being you know, acknowledged because part of the thesis, I think, is actually saying that this whole electronic dance music explosion um, is a significant artistic and creative movement, which has, you know, glo massive global influence. Absolutely. And to bring it back to, yeah, and to bring it back to what we were just discussing, or what you started to talk about then, which was the gay scene and, mm. and gay club. In fact, this is where the genesis of, of dance music, you know, certainly from disco comes from. It's um, a lot of gay trying to find places and in fact mixed mixed dancing was a really unusual thing back then so, yeah. so, so let's start by going back um you know to the very actually let's go back to the really beginning yeah. what brought you to music in the first place when you well, were little uh well I we grew up in a in a you know very small um house at Christie's Beach um very you know I would suggest lower class um my dad was a mechanic my mum well I don't think worked earlier on she had six kids um, I grew up, I guess, my dad had a collection of records and my grandmother had a piano, so there was always music in the house. Grandma was quite fluent in piano. Um, my brother actually picked up um, guitar and piano by ear. I always loved music and I was discouraged away from music when I went to Christie's Beach High School. One, because I didn't have confidence um, in myself, I guess, as a person, and I didn't really know what I was even good at. Um, my mum eventually was a single mum with six kids and we didn't have any finances to really go to any decent schools or anything like that. So it's a public school system. So I just started collecting records. And when I was young, um, my brother taught me his paper round so that we could make money for mum to afford or we could have money of our own. So mum was working pretty hard. So I spent all my money on records and Levi jeans and I loved music. <laughs> And when my dad was around, I would sit, I would sit at the football club, put on the football club, and I would beg the barman to put a countdown on every week, every Saturday, every Sunday, even the repeats. I had AM radios in my ears all the time. Um, I was quite tomboyish. So when I got a very cute jewelry box, um, do you remember the ballerina jewelry boxes? You'd open up the oh, jewelry yes. box at the ballerina. So I pulled mine apart. And I had an old AM radio <laughs> and I pulled the speaker out and I made mine into a speaker and hung it on the end of my bunk bed. And I used to, you know, tap my headphone jack, one of these very old school headphone jacks, and I'd plug it into my AM radio. And I just loved music. And I think the thing I liked about music was, like any music, it spoke to me. The lyrics in the song were speaking about what was going on in my world, but no one else was understanding so I literally spent all of my pocket money on records and music. That's all I ever did. And um, my record collection goes from cassette singles to seven. I've got boxes of seven inch singles that I used to use. Um, and I started making mixed tapes for people when I was at Hungry Jacks before I started, you know, like I said, at 16, I moved out of home with this bunch of people. And my first um, DJ that I saw doing with two records, I finally understood, wow, I want to do this. Like, And, and who... Who was that person? You know so, what? I, so don't, just... I can't honestly tell you who was actually DJing at the time, but I know the influences back then. There was a gentleman who was in the DJ box one night and I walked into the Mars bar and my best friend from primary school was behind the DJ box with this guy. And I walked and went, oh, my God, I hadn't seen Robin since we left grade seven. And I just went, what are you doing here? She goes, oh, this is my husband. He DJs here. I'm like, are you kidding me? And he had got Blue Monday and some other track and there was no gap. And I went, how the hell did he do that? Like, what, what is this? There's no gaps in the songs. I've been used to going to the old line and they'd have one turntable and a jock with a microphone doing, you know, a request, oh, it's so-and-so's birthday, it's their engagement. It was all rock and roll, Barnsley, Barnsley. You just go to this club and you're like, I want to do this. Like, this is insane. So I just hung out with them and whoever was DJing on the night, I'd just hang out in the DJ box a whole lot, like, and talking to them and, you know, what do you, you know, and just yarning records. And then one night, um, a guy called Glenn and I recently. Um, and so, Jojo, just where was that? In the Mars Sorry, bar. Sorry, I just wondered where was that? Oh, that was the Mars bar. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mars bar. And there was other lesbian so you nights. Found, 
Yeah. So you so just just in that transition because you're sixteen and I'm just you you've um you've been I think down it was about I think it was about seventeen. It was, it was in between six and we yep. tried to get into as many clubs as we could. Right. Because and the Mars bar was easy to get into because they never ever checked your your ID ever. You and know? I think the significant thing for younger people listening to is that this is kind of the, the time when when club culture is just emerging. There mm. aren't really clubs to go to. Like there there'll be pubs who might you know, have a jukebox. Mm -hmm. But music is very restricted at this time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you have to go to a record shop to buy music. Underground um, music especially. Like if, if yeah. we would go to with a Hungry Jacks crowd, we would go to the place that, you know, up Paraka and it was all commercial. And it was commercial dance, right? It was it was commercial stuff, top 40. It was okay. It was great. Berkeley, Jewels, places like that. But back then, earlier earlier on, you know, we had all the Blue Mondays and we had all the music that was being played at the Mars Bar and it was very eclectic and it was very uh, much right up our alley. And I don't know the time frame, so forgive me if I do, because it was somewhere between 16 and 18 that a gentleman called Glenn, I used to harass him endlessly. And one night he said, look, okay, Joe, do you reckon, or Josh at the time, it was a nickname that I had, um, he said, do you reckon you could do a toilet break for me? I need to go to the toilet, which is understandable because, you know, it's hard to go to the toilet when you're a DJ and you're the only DJ on all night. So he gave me a break and I played a few records and I was I was always doing that at parties as well. I thought, this is great, this is great. And then over the over the course of probably about three or four months, he would go, oh, do you want to take over for a little while? You know, do you want to take over? I'll go have a drink at the bar. And, of course, I wasn't getting paid. I was just doing this thing for just because he was giving me a go. And back then, girls weren't allowed to in the DJ box. And I'll go through this quick story. is because I looked like a cute 16, 17-year-old young boy, and I had a nickname called Josh, which was from Hungry Jacks, they thought I was a cute little boy. So, of course, I'd get in the DJ box, and I'd play these records. I'd go, what's your name? Oh, Josh. Oh, that's Josh. Oh, Josh, right? And then these nights would turn into three, four hours, then five hours. And then another night, the boss from the club come up and said, look, can you play all night? We've had to send Glenn home. He's completely out of it. He's smashed. Do you think you can play? I went, I'll keep playing. And then eventually, um, Glenn was getting too drunk too often. I'm obviously going through his own personal crisis. And I got offered a job there. Um, because I was, incredible. I was absolutely rocking it. Like I'd get on there and I just knew because of my knowledge of music that I'd been collecting and I'd been making mixtapes for my friends at Hungry Jacks who didn't know I was going in gay bars and things like that. They had known nothing about my life behind the scenes because that was a big no, no. Like I was very, very in, I was never out, um, for a lot of years. And that was very difficult as a gay person. Um, so basically, um, very much like Jewel, DJ Jules and Lexi, Lexi was before me and the legend has it and she has said, yes, this is a confirmation that she at the original Mars bar before me had to tape her tits down and wear a mask and wear a suit so she'd come across as being male so that she could play in the club. And that's, that's, that was her before me. And then I, there was a gap in, obviously, when I was still too young to be in the club. And then I came along at some point and wormed my way in on, on the proviso that I was a cute little boy. You know, I was a cute so little boy. With his name. To me, this is something like out of Shakespeare where the women have to dress up as, as men in order to be on the stage. And, and we're and talking just the 80s. It wasn't that long ago. It so, but not. also the interesting thing that you've identified is that it was at a gay club. So at that mm -hmm. point, what you're saying is that it was a kind of a gay misogyny in a way. I don't know if that would be a was male the same. It gay. was the same in straight clubs though. But the, the, the thing I like about it, Kathy, is everyone's got a gimmick, right? And I got away with it. It was like playing the game. Like oh, here's me, a young female who could, probably would never have got a gig anywhere else right, has wormed their way into the DJ box through friends, friends who just happened to be there, and then I meet this guy called Glenn, who's the, the current DJ, and he's like, yeah, can you play? Yeah, no worries. So I got away with playing uh, as a different person, and I, I played so, it. So, I think this is really important because one of the things that came up is, you know, why DJs always men? Um, and I've assumed it's just because men prefer to twiddle knobs, you know, it's just that... <laughs> Um, you know, so it was always a very male dominated area. But what and you're saying more than that, it's like you actually weren't allowed to. Like, so who was stopping you? Like, why no did you one feel was really stopping you? No one would give you a leg okay. up. All right. No one would because it was no. quite common that girls were not uh, DJs. They just weren't. And girls were never taken seriously in any male dominated field, if you really think yeah, about true. it. Yeah, true. Oh, right? yeah. Well, that's okay. right. It was the 80s. Right. Yes. So, of course, I was trying to push 
in an area and I wasn't and like Jules if you've listened to the interview everyone is that I just wasn't going to take no for an answer if someone tells me no it makes me more determined to want to prove yeah. them wrong right and so it was and more it, the cultural right so it was more the kind of the the, the kind of the cultural bias generally at that time rather yeah. than anyone going no you can't come in the booth that's lady. right that's right and because again I wasn't going to take no for an answer and I pushed doors and I pushed buttons and I spoke to people and I was you know <laughs> I was adamant I knew what I was talking about and I was like Jules I was on the dance floor I was I had a reputation as this young girl no one knew who I was I'd be on the dance floor from start to finish no drugs no I didn't even know what drugs were and they used to call me Ever Ready. Oh, here comes Ever Ready. No. She starts at nine o'clock on the dance floor. She's still there at six. No drugs, no nothing. She's just, ah, oh, she's loving the music, you know. And you get it, you get, you get an idea of what you should be doing. And then when the DJs weren't really cutting it, I'm going, I know what to do here. But this guy's losing it. Like he's just, he's got no finger on the pulse at all, or he's out of it, or he just doesn't give a shit. And I learned so much about that. So the legend has it is, is that I had a nickname at Hungry Jacks. Four of us got the, the, the job on the same day. Three of us had the same name. So in the staff room and one goes, oh, you'll be Joe, you'll be Joey, you can be Joanne and you'll be Josh because I rode a motorbike, right? And I used to come to work with a helmet and whatever, right? And then someone from the club scene had come to see me at Hungry Jacks after a cleanup. I said, I'll come in and have a coffee, stick with, and they kept calling me Josh. They said, what's this Josh thing? I said, oh, it's a name. It's stuck. Everyone just calls me Josh. So she started calling me Josh and everyone started calling me Josh. So when I finally got into the DJ boxes, they go, oh, what's your name? Oh, Josh. Josh is my nickname. <laughs> right. And and to think about it back then as it being such a drama, a girl having a boy's name and throughout my career, that's how people remember me. Who are you, Josh? Oh, I thought you were a boy. I said, you thought you were, I was a boy because of the name. So now we're living in a time where we're allowed to have she's, hers, them, they, whatever. And I was doing it right back then and people were frowning on it. And it was just a, it was just a nickname. And who would have known it would have become my nickname and synonymous with my career. But it also helped me in places like Sydney where they'd advertised me at a, at a, as a resident gig at ARC and it was just DJ Josh. And all the gay boys loved me but didn't know who I was because the DJ box was hidden. Yeah, back then it was. It was DJs right. were was not the rise before the so rise of the people DJ. would come running up to see who I was and they'd go oh oh what's your name I go Josh oh you're Josh and then it got around you know and then I had the female symbol on the o as a as a giveaway like female symbol yes. DJ Josh no one ever really got it and then at another DJ gig in the very very early 90s I got my first gig at a lesbian bar in Sydney and she'd run me after a week and said look do you think you could change your name because it's, you know, it's going to probably upset a few women? I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, could we call you DJ Wet? I went, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. No, that's not going to happen. Like, seriously, it's a nickname. So you're, hitting, like, you're hitting prejudices and, and mindsets left, right and centre and blasting through them too. Which is So when you talk about the yes. LGBTQ, there was yes. separatism, although we were a community, I I did a lot of lesbian events, but I ended up stopping them because they were too anti-men. And one woman had come up to me at a gig once and said, I can't believe you're playing this song. It's men. I said, yeah, but it's written by women. So what's the deal here? And then another one came up and asked me about another song. I said, well, you know, did you know that Melissa Etheridge actually has male producers and songwriters? So what, what's your problem? So to be honest with you, um, early on in the years, there was a lot of separatists. There's a lot of things about straight, mm. gay, men, women, there, 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 there. But I've always been quite neutral. And I think the great thing about um, dance music, and it starts with disco, is that, that those sort of mixed spaces were unusual. And I think that the mm. fact that, that this scene carved out those mixed spaces to, as far as I'm concerned, created the groundswell that changed the rest of society. I've got a theory that dance and dance music changes the world. Like that's, mm -hmm. to me, that sort of that space that was created in the underground scene at that mm -hmm. time, coming out of the 70s into the 80s, encouraged, you know, we are here for the music. We are here to um, to dance and, and enjoy this as a, you know, the whole peace, love, unity, respect, PLUR. Mm -hmm. Mantra and it was a safe space. Out of that. Yeah. And a safe space. It was a safe space. Right? The first time I walked into there, no one looked at me sideways. Mm. No one judged me. I thought everyone's dancing and they're happy and they're having a great time and I'm not getting hit up by someone or 
right. called a freak or pushed or I went, wow, this place is, this is home for me. And now that I look back on the history of Stonewall and, and dance music as a whole coming from America where, you know, it was the gays and the blacks that used to go to illegal yep. warehouse parties to be safe and not be arrested for, being, right. black, for being black or being gay. Yeah. So that's they it. started the warehouse revolution and then it just followed throughout the rest of the world. Everyone had the same idea. We'll go to this underground party and you go, there'd be drag queens and there'd be, you know, straight women, gay women, drag queens, you know, people that you didn't really know. And then it was very butch lesbians and very high camp men. And you just go, these people are awesome. You know, you'd have deaf people at the, you know, at Mars Bar. They'd, I'd remember them distinctly you know all there you know a whole group of deaf people in one speech yes. every week you know and no one batted an eyelid you no. know there'd be bad drag good drag muscle marys and you just go into this place and everyone there'd be there people in wheelchairs purpose. too yes. the whole scene the scene was all about you know it was it was more about wearing something to make yourself look different that you know that was mm. the key the things that would normally it was like real life had been inverted so to go back to that metaphor of the mall mm. where the normal was walking down it was kind of like there was this very there was this very um suburban uh very mainstream very restrictive culture mm -hmm. that people can and very conformist and then there was this other world which kind of looks more like the mall now where people yes. can uh you know um it's people are comfortable to have you know colored hair strange hair to kind of to look different yet that was it was such a people don't understand what a big thing it was to yes. look a little bit different back then yes. and how you would actually be attacked or harassed in public Ooh. if you if didn't appear to fit in the funny thing was is, is growing up with you know things like mtv and countdown countdown especially let's think about it you know when you think madonna first came out and then you had you know the cure you had the smears you had all these bands with makeup and the only place i remember seeing those people was at the mars bar and when i finally walked into that club i went oh finally i can find some people that have got pointy hair and pink hair and black hair and they're wearing madonna clothes and they look really funky. I used to hate going to the old line or the Red Legs Club or the Berkeley with all my friends. You know, to be beer swilling, you know, juicy girls, you know. And eventually the, the straight clubs, you know, the girls are dressing like Madonna and they'd come in and it was as far as they'd go, trendy was Madonna. They wouldn't yes. go any other left or right. It was Madonna or nothing. You know. That's right. And which which, you know, I say something about Madonna as a cultural figure who managed to move into the mainstream and influence a huge amount of people, like Boy George as well, too. I think you cannot underestimate. You know, at the time it was very sort of trivialized, I suppose, by um, you know, the establishment as being, oh, that's just sort of, you know, pop culture. Yeah. But it actually was it was it was revolution through music and style, no doubt yes, about that. Absolutely. Um, and Madonna and, was and an influence. It, it changed people's like, Madonna was huge, a massive influence huge because influence. I first saw her when she had her first appearance on Countdown and little did I know I would ever be playing in a nightclub and, and buying every single, I think this is her section up here, <laughs> um, of every single oh, record <laughs> and she is so influential as a woman in general. Yes. But the fact that and the gay community had embraced her so much but the fact that she had embraced and still does the gay community and, you know, everything was about Madonna and she worked with the best producers. The music just was, you know, it made up the gay community, you know, and then little Kylie mm -hmm. came along. But that's that's the roots where I started, you know. It was all about the people that were influencing us from such an early time and were the trailblazers for women especially, you know, because it was hard for me because I was never actually a pretty woman, didn't want to be a pretty woman. I was always very masculine. It was who I was. I was never going to change that, but I was stuck between these two worlds of my straight world with my Hungry Jacks people and the clubs that we used to go to and then my underground people that I used to go with, but I still never really fitted anywhere. Um, and when I first started going out, the lesbians were literally truck drivers. They had druggy shirts on and they rolled up their sleeves yeah. and had their jeans. You couldn't tell if they were a woman. They rolled their own smokes. They were butch as hell. And I couldn't, I, I don't well, That was very was... much the identity about yes. being lesbian back then. Yes. You, were, you were butch. Yes, you know? yes, um, yes. That, and and that, that's how it was. And, you know, they had male masculine names and, you know, they were very scary, but there was also that other way and they were very, um, and dare I say it, and without offending anyone, it was the very, very um, feminist lesbians who had their hairy armpits and their long hair and they wore their hippie outfits. They too used to roll their own spliffs and they used to all be about only hanging out with women. And I was at a time where it was kind of like it must have been the turn 
where people started just accepting people a little bit better and women were getting taken differently. And I can honestly say that I must have been there at the time to educate people about, you know, this is who I am. This, I'm going to, I'm going to be here. This is my, this is my DJ name. And I think stemming from a hard childhood and not being heard and not being seen and not getting enough attention. I think what music did for me when I first started playing it, it gave me attention and I was a very awkward kid. I was never that, how I felt was not very good looking. My sisters were beautiful. They were very pretty. I was very awkward. Um, I got attention for the first time. And even if it was from gay men, they'd come up and try and chat me up. And I thought it was great because look, this person's got attention. But playing music to people, they were just loving it. And most of the times they didn't even know who you were. They didn't even look at you. Back then DJs were geeks who collected records, who spent a lot of time on their records and music. And then if you got an opportunity to play that music and work a dance floor, it was an honour. And I got all the attention that I've ever wanted in life. And, and that's what drove me as I got older is that I was getting all this love and attention from people. And it was a drug. And it was as a big drug, but it was also an amazing honor to be able to control people like that and be a part of that history. So let's just go back a little bit and talk about that transition. You just said there was kind of like two worlds, your Hungry Jack's yeah. world. Um, then there was the underground gay yeah. scene where you were getting starting to kind of um, move up the ranks as a, yeah. a recognized DJ. Um, and then you mentioned you went to Sydney. So what started to merge those two? And at what point? Because is this around the time just as Acid House broke? Like, because no, I am using I, think it. I, I started, yeah. yeah, I started at the Mars Bar when I was very yeah. young. I don't exactly I know when that was. I didn't, I, it, there was no invoice books, there was no payments being made, there was nothing. Yeah. I was just jumping in there and I was getting opportunities, right? And then it became a resident gig I can honestly say it was somewhere between 1984 and in 1995 I finished at the Mars but I never played anywhere else except for friends parties um I you know I played a few sets near the end at, at Beans Bar I ran sleaze balls um I was a part of the Unity Foundation organization I put Mardi Gras floats in I started a night called Lick Lick parties um and this is how it panned out in the in the community in South Australia um, around about nine, I can't remember when Heaven was built, but I know that I was approached by the Adelaide Gay Paper and they said, Heaven Nightclub need a gay DJ, someone who, you know, looks pretty hot shit. And at that time, sorry, my cat's here. And at that time, Dead or Alive were performing at Heaven. I think it was on a Friday night. And John Pike had approached the Adelaide Gay Times and said, look, we need a DJ for, for um, Pete Burns for Dead or Alive. Can we, have you got somebody? Yeah, DJ Josh. So I was build, major build there. So the gay community, I was with them for, you know, from 1980 something to 1995. So as soon as I started playing at Heaven um, and Dirty House, I don't know if you went to all of the Dirty House parties, you were probably there. There yes. was a party there that they had started, that they had been coming to my Lick parties. And Lick was at the Freezer, Club Freezer Hilton, and I had quit the Mars Bar. That's a whole other story. Um and just to give a bit of context here, yeah. so it's, so for the for the, your um for the people who are watching as well too. So at this time, really, the Adelaide scene was going off. It was pretty much one of the biggest dance music scenes in Australia, and it um, was taking off, wasn't it? It was really, it was really, really thousands of people were flocking to the clubs. Uh, you mentioned Heaven was where you sort of crossed over, yeah, and, and to, to more that main. That that was the mainstream. That, that, that was well, I'd love to get the date for that yeah. because I'm not sure heaven was open for a bit, but ninety five sounds about right to me because ninety five is sort of the that groundswell had sort of happened, and then the, the the suburbs. Um, I think people like Steve Hooper had taken the 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 inner city club sound, which it was to the suburbs, and that had brought a whole mm. other um, new generation, young slightly younger generation, on board as well too. So the scene was huge, and it was yeah. it had grown because mm. we reached out to the suburbs and managed to get That's their right. ears before other states did. So in fact, heaven um, was one of the first super clubs um, of that scale in Australia. That's at that correct. Time. So, so from what Brendan was saying, who was one of the sort of key DJs, sort of South Australia is one of the first places where we get this sort of suburban explosion and this mass explosion first, which is really, it which was is great. Like so, of course, was I was controversial. Yeah, of course I was controversial because yeah. my photo shoot with the leather gear was one of my first photo shoots where I'd finally come to terms with and loving my own body. And it was the first time I'd gone out there and gone, this is who I am. And it was very controversial at the time, but they used that image quite often in advertising. It was really controversial, but some people really loved it. And I remember um, the girl who ran the Dirty House parties, 
she had approached me and said, look, HMC is doing a big party at St. Paul's. Um, she had been involved in coming to my sleaze balls and lick parties and said, because the party was Tony called. Tony Clark. In, yeah, Tony Clark. So she had a party called Intercourse, right? Dirty House Intercourse. It was one of their string of parties. They said, can you do a lick room? You, do, you supply the DJs, you do everything, we'll pay you, you know, can you do a lick room? I went, yeah. So lick was very much the side room of St. Paul's. And, of course, I wore my leather. They're all my friends were dancers and they had their leather gear on. It was all very gay and very, very undergroundy, naughty, you know. And everyone was coming up to me going, who the fuck are you? Because they'd never heard of me. Sorry about my swearing. Um, who are you? Who are Josh, Josh. Oh, my God. And they just look at me, right? And, of course, that night you can imagine everyone's like. And they're just looking at me in this leather garb and they're going, who are you? Like this. And it was from there, I think, that. Larry from Cargo must have been there. Jason Ravisi from Synagogue was there. They were all there. And they're going, who are you? Can you come and play in my club? And it just took off, right? And I had been told by the Mars Bar, you'll never work in this town again. You know that, don't you, when I left? And I went, you shouldn't say that to me. You should never, oh. ever tell me no. Here's your bottle of sun and comfort. You're never going to work in this town again. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so during that time, it just absolutely took off. And for me, it was the perfect time because the drug culture at the time was all about MDMA and ecstasy. And I can honestly tell you, if it wasn't for that drug, I don't think I would have been welcomed into the mainstream as easy as what I was without that feeling of everybody was in love with everybody and it, nothing really, you know, buzzed anyone out. And well, it's true, but I think at the same time, Dirty House, and I think um, were very much you know, because you know Cam was gay, Theo was gay. You know, they were together at that time. I mean, you know, we talk about that, them being sort of the heart seat of techno production. Well, it, they were gay men, and and so but I no think, one knew. No, Not they a didn't. Lot of people knew. Okay, okay but, don't forget <laughs> that the boys could get away with it. Look true. at me, I'm a screaming lesbian. Like seriously, yeah, no, like, not go anywhere yeah, without yeah. anyone knowing. And and it's no people come up to me again and go, I know you're a lesbian, right? And that's the first opening line they would say. And I go, is that all you got to say to me? Like, is that? And it's it so still wrong. happens. It still happens yeah. to this day. Right? But back then, if you think about it, Dirty House Records had its own little scene within a scene and you only were the who you knew who. And for me to be asked oh, to do a Dirty House party, I was like, yeah. who, me? Really? Oh, my God. I felt like I'd been adopted into this, finally, into this. You imagine I was like a kid in a lolly store going, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm working with HMC on a dirty house party. Like, seriously, you know? But during those times, my progression into the mainstream of Sydney and Melbourne was um, for 10 years, and I've got it on my very first resume. I've still got a copy of it. I had all the gigs I had done in the gay scene and all in a little picture and everything, and I said, and my, my goals is one day to play at Mardi Gras. All right? 10 years submitting tapes 10 years submitting tapes it wasn't getting anywhere so what I did is I said right I've got sleazeball coming up I'm running the sleazeball in LA I'm going to book some DJs from Sydney so I booked Kate Monroe Alex Taylor from DCM Jules from DCM uh, Lexi Bradfield Kate Monroe we got Lippy Lou over from the UK like I just kept booking people left right and center and the club freezer was packed every month the club freezer kept can you make it a weekly venue I'm going no no months a month I'm only good at this and during that time I was raising money to put the first Adelaide float in the 1994-95 Mardi Gras mm -hmm. so that lick party wasn't financially for me it was raising money to get us to Sydney I went mm -hmm. to my first Mardi Gras and I went oh <laughs> shit. how am I going to get into this so eventually, none of the DJs were giving me return favours. And then one day, Lexi Bradford, and that's why I want to speak to her, because she gave me my first leg up. Oh, no, it was Kate. It was Kate Monroe, actually, before Lexi. Kate had rung me and said, my bosses won't let me go away unless I can find a DJ that's as good as me to fill in. And I'm ringing you because mm -hmm. I need you to come in. Because I knew if I'd gone in, and she knew if I'd gone in, I didn't live in Sydney, I wouldn't take her residency. So she got me in contact with Gigi and Andrea and Andrea rang me and said, look, we've got another set downstairs. Do you think you could do a chill out session downstairs and then come upstairs? I said, easy. Took three boxes of records with me and totally annihilated both levels. These women were crawling the roof. They're who are you? Oh my God. Oh my God. It was <laughs> after that, that I'd got gigs at several lesbian nights over there, but I, I traveled there regularly um, over a course of time. 
And one of the guys I worked with, a Unity Foundation organisation, which was we were running sleaze balls and picnic in the park, which eventually we gave to Feast as their official parties. Um, I left the foundation and um, we, um, one of them was a guy who was a big talker and he had gone to Ark Sydney when it opened up and got friendly. I don't know if we slept with the guy, but he got friendly with one of the owners of the club and they said, you've got to give this girl a go. You've got to give this girl a go. Um, so at that year, um, a DJ had dropped out, I think around 1999 from one of the DJ tents at Mardi Gras. They were unwell. And because I'd already done a set, a couple of sets at Arc Sydney, um, they suggested that they put me in the tent last minute. So I'm in the tent and they used to have a segregated tent back then in 1999, believe it or not, you had the main RHI and had the Horden, but across the, the way you had two tents, big, big tops. One was for females, one was for men who didn't want to mix. I was, no. playing, I was playing in the female tent and it was going on. I was playing trance, like high energy, uplifting trance. Not and not many people were playing trance on the gay scene in Sydney. It was very housey, very um, progressive, very tribal, very serious. And here's me like, whoa. So all the boys, I remember coming to the side of the tent going, who are you? Can we come in? Oh, my God. <laughs> like, who are you? Because I was un unadvertised. I wasn't even on the bill. Right? So I got my foot in the door, this, this thing. Um, and then I got to know through doing a residency in Ark Sydney, I was blowing them out. I was going up there every long weekend on a Sunday night playing to predominantly gay men and making them go absolutely spare on high energy trance. None of the other DJs were playing trance. I was. So I was playing Melbourne scene. I was playing Sydney scene. I was playing Northern Territory. I was playing Tasmania. I finally met a guy who was on the Mardi Gras committee and we were having a chinwag one and he goes, oh, you are fucking amazing. You need to play Mardi Gras. I said, look, I've been trying for 10 years, dude. I have given, nearly given up. I said, I can't, I don't know what else to do. I've been billing Kate. I've been billing Lexi. They were all getting gigs. Why aren't I getting gigs? So he was on the committee and he, he rang me one day and he said, guess what? Are you sitting down? He said, I've got you a gig at Mardi, Mardi Gras. Main room, main set, RHI. I was at DJing at Fresh at the time and I just went down the wall on the floor and I was crying. I go, oh, my God, are you kidding me? Ten years. Ten years it took me. That to would have been from, so that would, would have been around, because if, if Fresh was around, that would have been around sort of the early 2000s. Is that right? About then. Yeah, that's that's a that's a long time. So I know, I know one of the Mardi Gras recently that Cam had finally got a set in one of the rooms there, but I was the only DJ up until Cam got there to play that side room the only Adelaide DJ, and I caused a big ruckus, let me tell you, because I got the main set every time. So the Sydney what, DJs you're... were not happy. They were very, very unhappy that an Adelaide DJ right. was playing Sydney gay, lesbian, Mardi Gras. And I've got articles on it. And I managed to play, I think, three or four main sets in the Mardi Gras. And because Mardi Gras was going down a little bit and they needed money, they said, if you play the sleaze ball for free for us, you'll get your next Mardi Gras. So there was one year where I played sleaze ball, flew myself over, sponsored myself on the stage. So I did, I think, two or three sleaze balls and four Mardi Gras. And at that time, I was voted um, the most popular interstate DJ in Melbourne. I was doing the Melbourne scene, straight and gay. I was also doing side shifts from Arc Sydney. So I'd do um, Sounds on Sunday with Baxter, Nick Fish, all those guys, Sounds on Sunday Recovery. I'd finish there. I'd get on a taxi. I'd go to the Kellett Street Ice Blocks and play banging hard house to really straight kids and then I'd get in another taxi and I'd go to <laughs> ARC and then I'd play uplifting vocal trance, just bang on, bang on. And, um, you know, that was the year I won um, number eight in Australia in the top 50 DJs in the first In The Mix DJ poll. Mm. I also ranked number um, one in South Australia the first three years. And I stayed in the top 50 DJs until all the young up and coming started, you know, oh, we're going to beat her, whatever. And they started beating me. But I I had national recognition. And that's why In The Mix got me a lot of votes around that time. Um, and it was the first time I'd been voted into something where it wasn't a male or female category. It was number eight in the country. Mm. And I was up there. I think Baxter was number two. And mm. there was other DJs in the top 10. I had... So Sorry, don't no, you, you go finish. I would I'll... never ever have thought, like when when you talk about the power of passion, when mm. you talk about the power of manifestation, and if you write it down and you will it hard enough, the doors do open. But I had to literally knock on a shitload of doors for every gig I had. I never did favors. I did a lot of favors for other DJs to get my foot in the door. 
you know, there was times where I literally, there was a position where Lexi had rung me. She goes, I've done a shift all night at Mardi Gras. Um, I'm billed all night at Mardi Gras. I don't want to do my recovery shift. Do you want to fill in at, you know, the club? I went, sure. She goes, oh, I'll probably stay open for a couple of hours. You'll be finished, you know, don't worry about it, you know, and he'll pay you at the end. I rolled into this gig on Oxford, uh, Oxford Street, introduced myself with my rock, box of records, started playing, and I'd seen people at the party that were at this party. I started playing and they went nuts, nuts. They were going crazy and all of them would come out and go, hey, who are you? Where are you from? That recovery started at 6 a.m. in the morning. I was still playing at 1. Lexi's run me going, where are you? I said, I'm still at the gig. You need to come down and play a set because they're still open and it's still full. I've run out of records. I can't do this anymore. So I'd managed to somehow fill in for all these other DJs and done all the work and I finally got myself into the, the mainstream market. So I was playing straight scene, gay scene, um, mm. playing gigs here. I was at the height of Dreamers, Synagogue, Cargo. I was working Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, flying out, coming back, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Um, in between Melbourne, doing straight gigs, doing gay gigs, doing base station, doing festivals. Um, I just travelled for most of probably 1996 to 2006. Mm. Yeah. So. Yeah. And what, what you've obviously, Matt, and what you just talked through as well. I mean, the first thing I just wanted to note or remark on mm. is, was it, was it the um, the first Mardi Gras where you got the gig and there were the two separate tents? And, that uh, was 1999, but it was unannounced. Like I literally landed yeah, that gig but, because they needed someone and I'd been playing some impromptu gigs at ARC already and they said, she's bloody good, put her on, she'll play trance, it'd be great. But the fact that there's this divide between, the, <laughs> you know, the, the female lesbians and the gay men, they're all the, and they're the trans Oh, yeah, the it happened. Trance music that, that kind of suddenly, you know, they, everyone's, again, just showing how much <laughs> it's music. Oh. Music, yeah. absolutely, how yeah. much power music has to actually make social change. Uh, and you know, it was not for... long after that they stopped the tents. They stopped the segregated tents and, you know, there was always, right. yeah. But it was the night I played. And the, the role R that music played. Yeah, yeah, the night I played the RHI and I'd been to Mardi Gras parties and let me tell you, you could never see the DJ or the lighting guy. You couldn't figure out who the DJ was or who the, the lighting guy was. You just see these heads, <laughs> right? But when I played... <laughs> that's how much you can see and all my friends were down the front all the Adelaide crew were down the front for my first set in the RHI this thing was random I don't know how many you hold in the RHI but it was huge and I started at midnight and I looked over in the DJ box and I saw this um uh crate that they put all the sound gear in and I wheeled it over and I stood on top and they could see the whole of me and I had them in the palm of my hands I had hundreds of thousands of people facing me and they could see me and I'm doing this to the music and doing this to the music and one of the guys from Mardi Gras had called one of the hotros from up top and told him to come down and have a look at what I was doing. And he'd come down. He said, I have never seen Mardi Gras ever like this. He said, I've never seen them do this. I said, that's probably because you've never actually put people in front. And he said, you have a gift. And that was when I got my next three sets because I had literally had, and people who had not even known me, international people, anything, they were just feeding off what was coming out of those speakers and all my crowd at the front who were, they were just going, oh, my God, who's this, you know? And for me, I finished that gig and I was sober. I was completely sober. And I, I, I everyone's going, come down, scream come down, you know, it's a photo. Whatever. I literally sat down behind the DJ box and cried my eyes out. I never, one, played a gig like that ever before. The fact that I finally got there after 11 years and how hard it was to get there. But the energy that came off that room that night, I've never experienced it since. I really miss that feeling of, you know, mobile phones were literally as much as texting. There was no photos. There was nothing. People weren't no. even allowed to have cameras in there. So there's no footage of it unless you can get it from Sydney Gay Lesbian Mardi Gras. Mm. But the energy and, and the emotion that was in it going, I fucking got there. I got there. I can't believe I got there. And it took all of that work leading up to it. And I think that's what that award has done for me because I don't think there's a lot of people that know a lot of my history from pre-1995. No, and I was the same, to be honest. So I, I because you're, you can't, in my mind, 
from having been, you know, been there at the time, you came to prominence around that time, so sort of 95 onwards. So I'd always put you with that slightly old, that next generation of DJs. And, of course, in the thesis, the emphasis tends to be on those very early, like the late 80s takes a, a, a big space up for me. So, it's you know, listening to you now, I've sort of realised that the Mars bar connection going right back to the new wave scene makes perfect sense, that you tracked all of that and just chipped away at it. But, of course, it took you twice as long as all the other buggers <laughs> when um, i started playing you know, trance because... at the club they were going you're gonna play that yeah you're gonna play that techno shit tonight josh or are you gonna give us some kylie and gone oh you know later because my shifts were like nine o'clock at night till seven in the morning yes right i started doing early shifts for years you know the early shifts you can come on early and then the dj will take over at midnight thanks for thanks for creating the floor for me i'll take it from here you know um i spent all those years in the 80s, right through to the 95s, practising my craft. And Cam talks about the same thing 10 years before because he's that little bit older again at Sinatra's and um, the disco scene where um, Angelo Amato was the key DJ mm -hmm. and he'd be doing, the, he'd be doing you know, like the, all the graveyard shifts, you know, you'd have sort of 10 till 6 in the morning. That's, <laughs> and he said that's where you learn. That's where you learn about how to that's and, and the, the crowd and how you kind of take and the journey of You playing. had to pace yourself. You had to. You didn't have yes. a choice. You had a nine, eight-hour shift, right? Mm -hmm. You learned. And, and I think that's the difference. I remember seeing Cam for the first time in the flesh at the Green Dragon. I went, oh, my God. And on the same night... I saw two, three people from Hungry Jacks there. And I'm not going to say who they were, but they were high in the ranks. And I went, like, I made out I didn't see them. I'm like, holy shit. Holy huh? shit. You know, like, oh, wow. What am I going to do when I get to work? Are they going to say anything? And when we get to work, they're just like, nod. And I'm like, nod. <laughs> but I remember seeing Cam at the Green Dragon in the very, very late 80s. And the Green Dragon was now where Faster Pass there is on South Terrace. That's yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. yeah, South yeah, yeah. So me and Cam go way back. I'm unclear if we're the same age or not. Um, I'm 57. I'm I'm unclear of how old Cam is. I actually get the feeling we're either the same or he's a little bit younger. I'm not I sure. thought, yeah, I thought pretty much, pretty much bang on the same. I think. Um, I sort of thought it was maybe a little bit older than you, but. Um... And to be honest with you, it was the gays and the Italians mm. that were playing all the dance music in the yes. early 80s. Okay, we were playing house music before everyone else. The only place I remember hearing anything similar to the Mars bar is when you'd go to the Rio's after Berkeley had finished and the Jewels and we'd all go down to Rio's and the DJ there was playing all the stuff very similar. It was still fairly commercial, but all the, the clubs down the strip were still playing your, your Barnsey, Farnsey, Wansey, Nutbush, 90s, 80s, you know, classic music. But it was the gays and the Italians in, in Adelaide DJs like your Angelos and all your KHMCs and all that that had their finger on the pulse because a lot of the labels, um, Central Station label and the media label were Italia House coming out of Italy. Italia House, that's right. And I think too, again, going back to that period, we talk about that division between, um, you know, having to hide a bit the fact that you're gay, you know, it's sort of a bit of another world um, that is very different to how you have to be on the. But again, uh, ethnicity as well too was one of those things that divided people because there was a lot of migration happening at this time and that very Anglo-Celtic mm -hmm. centre that dominated Australia and Adelaide in particular was very much the norm. And if you didn't fit into that, um, you know, there were, there were big territory. There were gangs, you know, yes. there were gangs of Italians against gangs of Australian boys like that. And was Greeks. The I went to Enfield High School after my mum got married again, right? And when you go out to Enfield High School from Christie's Beach, you had the skinheads, the rockers, the all, you know, the, 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 all the people that had been moved over from the UK, their rough as guts, to Greeks and Italian school. Right. So I didn't know where I fit it in there. And then I go to the Greek Italian school and I was about the only white Australian bloody, what they call me, dogger. Dogger, yeah, dogger. Yeah, yeah, it was was just what yeah. Dogger. yeah, dogger. I was a dogger. All everywhere around dogger, dogger. I'm like, oh my God. But it was. And yet um, there was that that underground scene, that underground element where we all sort of show. And I think that, you know, I can't speak for HMC, but those times when we had that little scene within a scene and all the people that, were the cool kids who weren't anti-gay would come along and it kept it kept the bogans out yeah you know what I mean it kept yeah. the rough nuts out yeah. and you had to mm. like gay people in order to get in that was that was how you got into the club mm. if you didn't accept how someone was wearing something or the name of the party being intercourse or being quite sexual orientated then you weren't a part of the cool kids you just weren't you know no, that was absolutely the it was it was about sort of accepting people for who they were that that you you know that that, that those sort of labels didn't hold any 
wait. We were yeah. all just there to enjoy each other's company, to dance, to listen to music and, and to express sexuality any way you wanted. I mean, that was the other thing too. It was, yeah. you, know, and, you know, Madonna, I, to go back to her again, was I think really significant in terms of shifting boundaries around what was sexually appropriate in public, you know, um, whether sexual. it be having a bit of sex drift. Book. Oh, yes, the sex book. The elusive friend of mine, hairdressing. <laughs> yes, how many copies? Not that many. <laughs> and for us gay people, it was nothing. We were laughing at the straight community having this massive la la over it, and we're going, "Oh my god, you're just so far behind." You know, like you really are behind. Yeah. What's yes. the big deal? We've been watching Madonna break boundaries and push people and poke people, and I'm like, "She's a legend." When you can push your boundaries about people not being open minded. Um, I think it's an important part of being a human. And I think that being influential as I am, and like I said, I'll go back to the top 50. If you look at who I'm in with, um, I believe Patty Wong, you know, look at how many boundaries and how many people she's poked and prodded at the moment. And she's still not completely accepted, but it's we have to be visible in the arts. We have to be visible in government. We have to be visible because we're strong and we're independent and we've got, We've got more of a risk to take, you know, because we are gay, because wider communities don't like you. You know that they don't. And if you can win people over, and I think being accepted as a person, I've always said, and this is a comment I've as had in all interviews, if society needs to catch up with me, not the other way around, I will not wear my hair long. I will not wear a dress. I will not wear my nails. I'm not going to, and I'm not going away. But I talk to people through music and I've won people over and hearts over time and time and time again through the music, you know, and the, the significant people in my life now and the reason why I get populist votes is because of that and, and we need to be visible and we need to. So getting into that top 50 with the people that I'm in with in Adelaide in such a real, like, I guess, closed-minded state is really important for young girls and young people who also identify with me. Well, I think so, absolutely, yeah. and I just think that the power of music as an um, as a force for activism and change. I think that's that's what it also shows as well too. That um, you know the effect that music can and music culture in particular um, can do in terms of changing people's perceptions. Mm -hmm. Um, out in public and I would say that you're absolutely on the vanguard of that I just want to go back a little bit too to talk about now you did get involved in production as well too in music yeah. production Could you, would you like to talk about that's a big part of the thesis as well too that I talk about yeah. local production yeah. and so I think around that that's going back to that 95 period too yeah. isn't it Dirty what happened, yeah I was always interested in it um, but again I was never ever studied music and I, I, I could kick myself for not doing it because there's so much to learn but after playing music for so long you kind of know what it is and how it's put together, but you just don't have the tools to do so. So in, I think it was around 97, 98, 99, somewhere around there, um, Tim Erickson, who was better half of the Skip Raiders from the movie, um, they, he worked with Paul Oakenfold on a song called Another Day, um, which was the soundtrack to Kevin and Perry Go Large. His wife um, had moved to the UK and lived there for 10 years and married Tim, and then they decided to come back to Australia. And I was the first DJ in Adelaide to have a website um, when my friend uh, Amelia Mazone um, wrote code and she was learning how to build websites, she goes, can I build your website for you? Because, you know, I think you should be the first DJ to have one. Mm -hmm. Tim and Mem had looked for a DJ to work with in Adelaide in order to for Tim to do music and for a DJ to go out there and promote it. So they got in contact with me and I remember them coming around to my house on the day that the week they arrived from the UK and they walked out my backyard, I'm cleaning my motorbike and there's Tim, Mem and and I'm like, oh my God, this is Tim Erickson from Skip Raiders, you know, he's worked with Oakenfold, oh my God. So we got really, really good friends and I started co-producing with him and writing songs and um, yeah. I'd sit, we'd go two, three weeks in the studio together um, and because he's been... He was in a band in the UK in his early 17s and 18s. He also ran a record store where they sold um, all the controllers and all the 808s and 909s to the big guys like the Shaman and all of those sort of people. Very knowledgeable about everything. So he had like 20 odd years in music and I had nothing. But he put me in the studio and we worked together. And let me tell you, creativity came and it was flowing. Um, I didn't have time to be writing my own music or learn the programs or, you know, it's it's big work so I was shadow producing with him we worked on a projects with Icehouse um, never would have thought I would work on Icehouse projects I loved Icehouse and the flowers 
Um, we did Hayley, uh, sorry, Electric Blue on that album. Um, Tim and was um, got a proposal from Grace Jones, the Grace Jones' son. They sent a DAT tape over um, with some lyric on it, what she'd recorded, and they said, we need a song from this. We couldn't open the DAT tape. We had to send the DAT tape back to the UK. They would put it onto a thing. They sent it back, sent the vocals back, and we sat down for two, three weeks with this vocal from Grace Jones, and I was absolutely mind blown that we're doing a song with Grace Jones. Couldn't believe it. So we sat down and listened to these tapes and we wrote down all the lyrics and then we put them in and we cut them all up and we, we created a song called Love Bites. Very grindy, very dirty, and it's her doing this vocal and it's just amazing. Um, so we worked on a lot of projects here. So I was in contact with all the record labels and then they would say, hey, do you want to do a remix? And I just started dragging people in. So I was the middleman between getting the production and then getting the vocal or saying, oh, this vocal should be this. And we just started working on projects. And we worked for four or five years on a lot of productions. I don't have a big studio myself. I don't have my own work, but I worked with Tim. Um, then he had kids and then um, music as it was. I think I was working, I was working the last Central Station store in Marion. Um, USB was coming in or CD was coming in. Vinyl was going out. And then iTunes came along. There was no money in music. And we weren't making money and Tim had to go out and get work. I had to go out and get work. Um, mm. We both ended up having less mm. time with each other and then um, he couldn't do more work anymore. So he was my main man um, that mm -hmm. we worked together on for projects as JVE, 33 featuring Costa. Um, and we did remixes for some big names, Slinky Minks. Mm. Um, we did a version of Summer Rain. Um, we worked on stuff we'd written together called Star Rider with Amy Jackson. Um we did work with, um, who else, Baxter, who signed us to her label um, and she did remixes of our stuff. We started swapping remixes. Um, so, yeah, I've got a, a little bit of a cachet of production. Um, I wish I have time to actually set up my own studio, but this day and age, these whiz kids, they, they're really good at it. But um, I'd like to work on some productions later on um, of my own, um, but I'm mm -hmm. delving into the chill factor. I'd like to create... Um, a new thing where people could come and actually meditate a dance floor rather than go to a dance floor and actually, mm -hmm. yeah. And that I've done one of those already, which is, um, um, it worked really well. It, I had a couple of victims that I put into a room and we put them into a trance-like state and then I played this chilled down stuff and yeah, they, they were mind blown by it. So keep your eye out for that because that's where I'm headed. I'd like to actually spend some time doing stuff off my own eventually, but yeah. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, it's a sound bath. So um, I've done a sound bath, and it's incredible. Mm, so, great, um, the way that the way that sound can sort of affect our mental health and our physiology mm. and our well-being too, like dance as well too. I think those sort of therapeutic yeah. benefits of music and dance are only starting I, to be yeah. understood now it, it, look, too. Everyone, and, everyone knows it though. Like, let's face it, tribal music was the only universal language we spoke and understood, and it still is. And um, you know, musically. I know I've got a bit of flat back from other people who say I'm not a real producer because you don't use the computer or you don't write the lyric. But you know what? I know keys, I know songs, I know lyrics, I know everything, and I worked on my part of that project, and it was a yeah, big part of that project. And I think that's absolutely. important to um, because I know there was a lot of DJs out there giving some people like us a bit of a hard time about that. But you know, some of us have never had time. You know, I had a full time career. There was no time, and as we started getting computers, it started becoming more easier. I've never spent enough time on a computer because I've had so much to do, you know. Um, but I'm proud of what we did and and the stuff we worked on together was absolutely brilliant. I loved working with him because we worked so well together. Um, and it's something that's now, I one, another one of my goals is get my name on a piece of vinyl, you know, mm. and I did eventually just before vinyl finished. I think um, the last two versions of 33 featuring Costa have my name on them and I have two synonymous so that one people don't know who I am and one and one on the other. And and it was like, I got the vinyl, I got my name yeah, on the vinyl. That's fantastic. You know. Um, uh, and I know how important that is to for for DJs who want to produce and want to create music. And I, I mean that and that's a significant contribution again to to dance yeah. music at its sort of um, formative stages as well too and I think it's one of those things in terms of DJ culture that people from the outside who don't really understand what DJs do 
um, you know, they are they do make the music. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but so I, it's often not understood from the outside. Mm. I think people just think DJs play other people's music, but of course, it's actually DJs and their producing ability with varying yeah. phases of technology who actually create electronic music. <laughs> so, and when you think about it, the music that um, was being made before and, and, is is the music that was being made before is coming from the DJs. You're smart if you're a producer to work with the DJ. Go right well, at this point, you need to do this, and at this point, they're going to do this. And bring that sound in here and cut mm. that out and then now now ramp it up ramp it up here or there's a certain sound to go well this is the sound that they're reacting to you need to work on this basis you know and i think some of the best well, DJs... it's, the, it's the revolution of the studio it's a revolution of the studio in terms of music production i think too and um, but i think sometimes that's sort of the aura of live performance um you know guy with a guitar in his hand sort of tends to obscure the the you know how revolutionary disc culture and studio production um, has been in music making, you know, for, <laughs> on every level. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, uh, to be honest with you, I thought I was going to start winding down a little bit. And I think yeah. at, at, at 57, it's it's getting more and more difficult. I know that even a lot of the bands yeah. these days are finding it difficult to tour. I'm healthy, I'm fit, I've got another couple more years in me. But, you know, before the end of it, you know, getting that that acknowledgement now makes me feel like I've done, achieved us so much. And this interview helps me also go back on a career and really nut it out for myself as well and see how much I actually really have achieved. And it's important that on the back of that, the people who don't know me get to see this video and see why and why it's important for me to be acknowledged because there was, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret, is even one of the awards back when we were doing the Central Station Dance Music Awards, I was asked to introduce a female DJ category because I kept getting so many votes, I was beating all the boys and the boys were getting their noses out of joint. And I'm like, oh, okay. So some of my awards were female DJ of the year. Female DJ of the year. Okay. Female DJ so at that of the year. point, they couldn't that, acknowledge you just true, as true a story. DJ. True story, true story. And I, I don't want to offend anyone, but that's a true story. And all of my awards up on the top of that cupboard are all from Adelaide, all female DJ of the year. But as soon as I got into In The Mix in a national award category, it was DJ, number one DJ in South Australia. Finally. That was, that was important to me. Mm. Well, it just says, too, it maps a whole transition around um, gender as well too and discrimination as well. It, they, and I'm not saying, and, yeah, and I'm not saying any of the boys should not have got it. It's just that I've worked so hard that I felt like I deserved to be acknowledged with them or above them. Not because it was a competition, but I had put just as much hard yards in and I was the only Adelaide DJ that was doing a national circuit like I was. Well, as an equal, really. That's all you were asking to be acknowledged, isn't it? As an equal, you know, just I'm another yeah. DJ, really, that's all. <laughs> because all of them, even Cam, you know, he should have been winning those awards because he's such a silent guy and I love him. He just sticks to himself and he does his thing. I love it, you know, and he can be easily recognised. But I was mm. up there with him, but a lot of people didn't know even who I was until I started making some noise. And coming mm. in with a controversial name and a controversial costume and a, you know, like here I am. <laughs> <Over here. laughs> I'm really good. I'm really good. <laughs> and you've been running a and you've been running a number of uh, you know and it's, it's, it's as a phenomenon too though. I mean your output during that period, um, you know, was seismic and and maps all sorts of changes and and you know instigates change as well too. But I mean, even in the last ten years, you haven't stopped. I mean, as you said, you think you might be sort of slightly diverting now, but you've been playing parties and reunion parties too because there has been a big reunion thing that's kind of gone off in the last ten years, as we all know. Can I, can I tell you the story of the golden years? Was I hadn't played for quite some time. I was working, doing spits and spats, doing lots of you know little gigs and stuff. But for the first time in my life, I felt like. I needed to do something for me and it was my 50th birthday and I always, I, I always thought I should do my own event. I set up a Golden Years party, called it the Golden Years. Um, I booked the Akaba and took a punt. I thought it was going to fail dismally. I didn't know if I was going to make it work. Um, and I sold out 700 people, my first Golden Years. Yeah, brilliant. Right? Congratulations. No one <laughs> knew it was my 50th birthday. Because I was playing to people 10 years younger than me all the time throughout my career. So they all thought I was the same age. Mm. So they, mm. I, had a, I had a gold turntable made and it was spinning and everything, lights, everything. It was a cake. And they brought it out and they said, the reason why we're actually here tonight is DJ Josh's 50th. Everyone just went, wow, 50. I said, yeah, this is my birthday present to myself and, and thank you for coming because 
my whole career, I've worked for clubs, made them a lot of money. They put me on last. They put me on the bill, put me on for 45 minutes, not bill my name properly. You know, they, I went through so much shit, got, didn't get paid that much. Let me tell you, $150 an hour still has not changed. But for the first time in my life, I made money off myself. Yeah. And I proved <laughs> to people that I could fill a stadium myself. Hmm. And then we're up to golden years next year. 40 years celebrating. I will announce it here now, be the first to announce it, that it is going to happen um, July next year. Um, it will be back at the Arca Bar and it will be celebrating 40 years. So all the music we've been talking about will be played in, in some sort of format. <laughs> um, and that, to me, to get to that point at 40 years, in the top 50 at 50, over 50, still doing it is one big thing for me. And also to let you know, Cathy, that um, I'm going to try and set up an exhibition next year in Feast for the history of my 40 years and in that we're getting people to get together with all the boxes of flyers and boxes of stuff and hopefully we're going to put that also in the gay archives and also hopefully in um, some of the stuff in South Australia as well so I think that it's time to put it all into video it's time to put it all into the history um, and work with people on um, collaborations with um, trying to show people where we were at, like you were doing as well. So that will be hopefully hopefully next year. We're in discussions over Christmas with a couple of people um, to put together an exhibition. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. It would be good to have a chat with you about that as well too. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to I'd love to have a chat with you over that as well. So guys, make sure you keep an eye out on the advertising coming up for next year. Um, and like I said, I will be working, doing less corporate work and less DJ work this year and more work on the event for next year. So I'm going to try to head down, bum up and try and collate an exhibition, maybe hit up the government for some money to help me out. Um, but I think it's time that Adelaide got behind me and the, the culture of what we created and put it in somewhere where people can, you know, um, read about it and, and look at it for the, you know, for the rest of the years. Yeah, I think it's very, very important to to document the scene and for it to be acknowledged as well too. Um, mm. I think the fact in some ways that the music still has currency, it hasn't dated. And so mm. I think sometimes we're because, and that's, I find that quite exciting that it's still, mm. You know, the music still annoys people, you know. They're still like <laughs> old people and you're going, well, actually this track's actually 30 years old or 20 <laughs> years old. <laughs> um, but you wouldn't know, you know. It's no. the sort of thing that the, any kid who's sort of, uh, you know, 18 might be listening to, uh, you know, on the radio or on their headsets or whatever. So, And I find that really kind of, it's like, oh, oh, it's like oh, a trick. I know. <laughs> you know what the great thing was at the first Golden Years and a couple of them is the fact that people had come up to me with their kids and had just turned 18 and said, these kids were babies in the back seat listening to DJ Josh Torrance music and yeah. they love you and they've come here tonight because they're old enough to be here and I thought there's two generations in my audience there, right there, and it's it was beautiful. It was just really nice to see that and, and know that, you know, that culture has spread out into generations and, as you said, they love it. Isn't it fantastic to get another generation who, who, um, you know, who are moving it on again? It's mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's been very exciting. Well, yeah, yeah I'd just like to say thanks again, Josh, for asking me, you know, to talk to you today. And again, it was so exciting to to for you to get this acknowledgement mm -hmm. and you know for the culture to be acknowledged as well too. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. And uh, yes, we definitely need to get together about yes. yeah talking stuff. So thank you to Kathy, and um, I'll catch you guys. Uh, we will uh, see you again soon on the next instalment. We hope to have Lexi Bradfield coming up. Um, we look talking to Mark Alsop and also a good friend of mine, Jason Pryor from Melbourne. And uh, I'll catch you guys on the next video.